Hi, Andrew Eubanks here, pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. I just want to thank you for watching this sermon. It's been such a blessing to be able to do ministry through the various media outlets over the past few years. And, and we just want to thank you for your love and for your support. And we just thank God for you. But just before we get going with the message, we just want to lay before you a deep conviction that we have here at the Agape Family Worship Center that we really prayed about. And, and that's that this video sermon would really help to stir up your affections and your walking with Jesus and, and shape you and more you into the image of Jesus Christ but we also want it to be something that would be supplemental to your relationship with the Lord and in no way replace uh, the church that you should be plugged into into or the pastor that God has put over your life to shepherd and care for your soul if you don't have a church home we'd, we'd love to have you come and be a part of agape but please enjoy uh, the next hour or so of this message and we pray that God uh, would use it to, to stir up your life and move in your life in a really profound way. God bless you. My name is uh, uh, Brother Billy, uh, Coach Billy, as many people know me. Um, uh, I've been in this ministry for like over 25 years. We started from Triple C. My name is Junior Heisen. I've been involved with the football ministry for over six years now. My name is Mertilyn Jones. I've been a part of the football ministry for about eight years. I had a vision and um, I shared it with, with Pastor Al um, over 25 years. And we, we then took it from there and we had like a Saturday um, and then during the week we, we started to have it with the youth group and then we extended it to the community. And from that it just took off um, and from that we decided well we're going to do it for the smaller kids. So I got involved with the football ministry because of the fitness, keep your body fit and to watch the young people grow in that way also. Well, it was for personal reason actually because I like playing football and it was easy for me to get in with that and then Coach Billy asked me to help him out there and um, it was just easier to just get involved um, rather than just playing football and you know, I just and love it. This is 11 years for the camp right now and we found that this ministry is been very successful um, touching the lives of young people, especially from broken homes. Because we reach a lot of um, kids who don't have fathers, who have, you know, we, we're father figures to those. Um, and um, we've actually seen, you know, a um, couple of guys actually got saved through the ministry. And it, it means a lot to me because we're actually helping those underprivileged children and, and people to just, you know, get a better life. You see the development that come forward from them. And this is important to the community also because we come together as one, we can relate to one another show love and show compassion to the outsiders. It is not only for Agapeites, it's also for the community and the wide. Um, you know, we save one life, we save a community. Um, it's all about community anyhow. We're, I mean, Christianity is about community, period, about us all um, putting, pulling together to make make it a better community so um, you know having to save a child or you know you know give a child a chance it's it's going to improve the community altogether. Um. And, and we, we found that a lot of the children, they, they travel from West Bay, Georgetown, East End, North Side, and especially in the Georgetown area. Um, and we have kids all the way from Jamaica. So 11 years for the camp, and, and that's a success. So we, I, I, I had this vision and I, I shared it with Pastor Al. And Pastor Al then took it and uh, said, but let's, let's go and do this and, and see what happened from there. So that's how this, this was formed. To reach out and, and, and help and save you know, um, others, whether it's children, adults, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's, it's for us to reach out and spread the word of God, you know, and, 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 and that's what we're here for. To see the young people, not only playing football, but to come to Christ and know the Lord Jesus Christ. So we also do ministry out there, we talk to them about the Lord, we pray for them, and we also encourage them to find a church and go to a church. 
But my main mission is to, to, to lead people to Christ. Um, at a young age, um, I came right up, um, I played professional football and I utilized that um, and then I became a, a FIFA referee and then now a FIFA referee assessor. So I decided, well, it's time for me to give back into the community and um, what better way to do it, doing it than, than to help with these kids. So uh, we started off with seven kids and out of the seven, seven kids, um, it ran like close to 25 to 50 persons every evening, Mondays and Thursdays. So we found it to be very successful. You, you never know, um, you don't know which life you touch, whose life you touch. Um, and, and we see it in, in examples after examples. Um, the kids, they come from directly from school. They don't have anything to eat. They, they might be in a situation where the home is, is broken and, and there's no parent. And when they come out on the field, we try to show them the love of Christ. We try to be uh, supportive to them, encourage them, and, and to lead them to the right path. It's just more than football. It's, it's more than football. That, that would be my that my main goal would be the fact that it's more than football. It's a ministry. It's it's reaching people. It's it's fellowship, and um, and that means more than the word kicking a football. You find love. You find appreciation. You find acknowledgement. of people acknowledge you. Yeah, I see that the Lord has been working working on me. To, to help these kids. So I ask the Lord every day in this ministry. It's not me, it's nothing that I've been done doing. It's all about you. So that's why I give God praise in this ministry. So I think the ministry in a whole, um, we need as a body of Christ to get behind each ministry, not only the football ministry, but all the ministries in the church. You know, the Lord wants the body of Christ to be healthy. We want him to get involved. So that's the reason I said, you know, I'm gonna leave what I'm doing out there in the world and come and be a part of, of the ministry here to, to, for the body of Christ. So we've been talking over the last few weeks about the Christian life and what it means uh, to take the gifts and the, the talents and the things that God's given to us and, and the vision that God's given to us as Christians and just to be able to live it out. And you know, uh, it, it's been really just tremendous to see how over the course of the last few weeks, God's just used uh, the messages to just stir us up and encourage us. And, and it's just been such a blessing to me to see how God has just been, been working. But before we, uh, before we dive into the message this morning, let's just start with a quick word of prayer. Just ask the Lord to just be with us now in this time. God, we thank you and we, we give you praise. We give you, Lord, uh, just we can't imagine, God, just how uh, amazing you really are. And Lord, we want to have a taste of, of just how truly good you are to us. And, and Lord, this morning as we look at your word, I just pray that, that, Father God, you would open our ears, that you would open our minds, that you would open our understanding, that, Lord, as we run this race, that, Father God, that you would just move through us and, and in us in a mighty way. I pray now for my brothers and sisters, God, that as we listen to this message this morning that you've given to us, just have your way, God, above all else. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's really great when uh, God begins to just speak to us and speak into our lives in a really profound way. And, and when the Bible doesn't just become some words on a page, but when they come alive to us. And, you know, that's really just what, what's been happening uh, to me, to be honest with you, uh, as I've been just studying and preparing my messages. Just the, the word of God has, just, has become so alive to me. And, you know, over, when we started talking about running, we started talking about vision. And we said that we, we need to have a vision and that vision positions us for a win, right? We need to have a vision for, for our lives and, and we need to have a godly vision, the vision that God gives us so that we can be positioned for, for a win in our lives. But then last week we talked about perseverance and how we need to run with perseverance and how we need to have that in our lives and the importance that perseverance holds for the Christian and for the believer. And it's just absolutely uh, one of those things that, that is just absolutely amazing to me how God uses perseverance in such a profound way. And so we need to have a vision. We need to run with perseverance. And then that brings us to today where we need to run toward the goal. We need to run towards 
the goal or the finish line if we want to say that. You know, and God just, he has this amazing way of taking uh, the things that he, he spoke into us and just interweaving them into our lives. And so, you know, vision and perseverance, for instance, are, are two words that are by no means exclusive to, to Christianese, as we call it, or Christian uh, language that Christians use. But they're words and references that, that really have a, a much uh, broader use. Because, you know, sometimes in Christian circles, we get used to using certain words and they become normal to us. But, you know, when we start talking to unbelievers and, or, or people that, you know, of, of different faiths or, or whatever, you know, we start using some of those same words and it confuses people sometimes. And so, you know, one of the big ones is, is with communion. You know, you get up to take communion and you start talking about a piece of bread as a body and a, and a little cup of grape juice or wine as, as the blood of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden people start going, what's that all about? You know, to, to us as Christians, some of us, that, that's just absolutely normal. But for, the, for, for people who don't know, it, it sometimes gets a little confusing for them. But... These two words, vision and perseverance, they're words that, that we use all the time, you know, even when, when you listen to, to most leaders talking today, whether they're Christian leaders or they're business owners or whatever capacity of leadership they fall into, you know, vision is something that they're talking about. You know, you've got to have a vision for your life. You've got to have a vision for your business. You've got to have a vision for X, Y, Z, whatever it is, you know, and you need to be willing to persevere and push forward. We hear about these things all the time. Because they hold an important place in the life of every single person. But how much more important it is, is it in the life of the believer when God tells us you need to have a vision and you need to persevere. So we come beyond that now. And, and as a matter of fact, we've been talking around Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. We actually haven't gone into Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We've, we've sort of been using it as our theme, but we haven't been, been really diving into to it. And so for the past couple of weeks, uh, that's what we've been doing, just kind of skirting our way around Hebrews chapter 12, uh, going and uh, just talking about a number of different things. But today I want us to focus in on Hebrews chapter 12, and that's really our main scripture today. And, and if you have your Bible, you can turn to Hebrews chapter 12. That's basically where we're going to be all morning because there's just absolutely so much in, in, in just these first few verses here of Hebrews chapter 12. It's just absolutely amazing. But our theme throughout all of this has been Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, which says, let us run. As a matter of fact, can we read that together on the count of three? One, two, three. Let us run. It's such an important uh, phrase because, and it's really sort of at the crux, at the core of what uh, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews is saying to us here in Hebrews chapter 12. And, and it has such a, uh, it's such a broad theme, and, and we've talked again uh, around Hebrews chapter 12, going all over the place in the Bible, but we haven't focused in on Hebrews chapter 12, and that's what we're going to do this morning. And so while we've talked about the various analogies uh, that are used throughout the scripture of, of Christians running the race, running the Christian race, or, or just living the Christian life is really what it's about, today we haven't really stopped and talked about it. And so today that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about it in a lot greater detail. But that's been a deliberate thing. I want you to understand that. Because I believe that it was important for us to set up some footwork before we started running right into it. You see... In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, we're nearing the end of the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews is, is, is really a, a, an amazing book. If you've never read the book of Hebrews, I encourage you to, to read it. If you're a believer, uh, it's really just an, such an encouraging book to be able to read. But when we get to chapter 12, we're nearing the end of the book. And while we have not looked through the book of Hebrews, it's a book that's filled with many practical applications for the life of the Christian. It's a book that is filled with much wisdom and knowledge and understanding and just practicality for, for, for believers and, and Christians running the race. And so there's a lot of things that we can learn from it. And as a matter of fact, if I had to describe the book of Hebrews to somebody, I would describe it as a book that is of encouragement to believers to keep pushing on, to keep running the race by focusing on who Jesus is. That's really what the, the, the book, I, I would say, is about. It's about helping us to be encouraged to keep running the race, to keep seeking after God, and to keep our eyes on Jesus. 
And so that brings us to today's scripture. And so let's, let's read it together. And we're going to read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 2. And it says this, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And that's all one sentence that, that, that we just read, and, and it's just absolutely awesome what is really just packed into just these two verses. And really, we're not moving really anywhere else this morning except these two verses because just what is in them is just absolutely profound and amazing. But in every race, remember the theme is, is, is we're talking about running the race. In every race, there's usually three things that, that is really important through the race. There's the fans, there's the race itself, and then there's the prize at the end. And so whenever we talk about a race, you know, those are really the three things that we, we look at. And, you know, again, this year is an Olympic year. So, you know, one of the things that's absolutely amazing is when you look at the stands and you see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people sitting in the stands to watch these events take place. And it's just, you know, it's one of the exciting things about it. As a matter of fact, you know, if you've ever been to a major sporting event like that or to any major event where there's a, a big place like that where thousands of fans are around you, it's just absolutely electrifying being there. Because you're there, and, and to be honest with you, being a fan in the stands is almost as exciting as the game that's going on uh, on the court or in the field or wh whatever it is they're doing. But it's just absolutely amazing to just be a fan there. You know, I remember a few years ago, we went to a, a basketball game, and, you know, we're there, and everybody's shouting, everybody's screaming, everybody's cheering for their team, and, and it was just, I, I, I enjoyed being a fan more than I enjoyed the game, to be honest with you. It was just fun. It was just great. It was amazing. And, and so we've got the fans, and then we've got the race. You know, we're there for a purpose. We're there to watch this race being run or watch this game being played. We're there to see it, but we're not just there to watch this thing happen. We're there to cheer on our team or the person that's running the race or doing the event, and we want to see them do what? We want to see them win the prize. You know, when I, uh, I haven't been keeping up with the basketball games, but I understand that, that Golden State, you know, has been putting a, a whipping on OKC in, in the basketball finals. And, you know, it, it's amazing because everybody, when you look at Facebook and you look at Twitter and Instagram and all this stuff, you know, everybody's talking about their favorite team. Why? Because they want their team to win the prize. That's what they want to see. They want to see their team win the prize. I see, I got an amen there. Somebody wants them to win. Yeah, see there? So we have these things, and when we come to Hebrews chapter 3, we basically see these three same things being mentioned here to us in Hebrews chapter 3, we, and we're going to kind of break that down this morning. So when we talk about Hebrews chapter 3, we see the fans, we see the race, and then we see the prize as well. And I want us to just kind of move through, sorry, not Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 12. So as we move through Hebrews chapter 12 this morning, I want us to see these things. So we're going we're gonna to break it down just a little bit. So we jump back to Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, sorry. And it says, therefore, say the word therefore with me. We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, I want you to, to, to realize these two major parts of this. It begins with a therefore, and then we're, we're stopping part way through the sentence, but, 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 but the part that we're, we're ending on is a great cloud of witnesses. Those are the fans. Now, when we see the word therefore at the beginning of a sentence, it means that there's been something that has been said previously that's really important to what's about to be said. And so the writer of Hebrews, when he begins to, to, to write to us and, and talk to us in the beginning of chapter 12, is telling us, hey, you got to look back just a little bit and see something that's been mentioned to you before. And like I said, we previously haven't gone through the book of Hebrews, and so we haven't talked about what that therefore is. But I want you to, to understand that therefore is connecting us to something that's really important. And that thing that's really important is, is that great cloud of witnesses. Who is this great cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrews is talking to us about? 
Well, if you were to read Hebrews chapter 11, and we're not going to do that today, but I encourage you to read it. If we were to read Hebrews chapter 11, we would read a chapter that is chock full of amazing stories of amazing people that we read about throughout the Bible. We see people who were found faithful in their expression of their faith and who lived out their life of faith, who ran the race faithfully. That's what we find in Hebrews chapter 11. And when we look at at Hebrews chapter 11, we find people like Abraham, people like Noah, people like Moses, all kinds of different people that, that are pretty popular and that people at least have some kind of idea as to who they are. And there's a whole list of people that are mentioned there. The entire chapter is dedicated to talking about the people who have run the race and were faithful. And that's what we find there. All of them ran the race, maybe not knowing the full extent of the race, maybe not knowing the full extent of the reward, maybe not even understanding the extent of the impact that they would have, but they ran the race faithfully. You know, I doubt when Abraham, all those thousands of years ago, was, was just doing what he was doing, that, 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 that he imagined that, that thousands and thousands and thousands of years later that we would be talking about his life. I doubt Abraham really ever imagined that. I doubt, I doubt Noah, when he was being faithful to God and building the ark, that, that he, he thought that, 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 that we would still be talking about him. Moses, when he delivered the people out of, out of Egypt, you know, none of these people really thought anything of what they were doing except the fact that they were being obedient and faithful to what God had called them to do. That was it for them. That was the extent of, uh, of their mind's thoughts. They just said, you know, I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm going to be faithful to what God's saying to me, what God wants to do in my life, and, and I'm just going to obey him and do what he's asked me to do. I'm just going to run the race that I've been called to run. And that was it. But here's the thing, is that we're here this morning because God gave them a vision and they persevered through that vision and they fulfilled the call of God that was on their life. They ran the race and they completed their part of the race. And they handed the baton off to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation until eventually all those generations led up to us here now today. They never thought that they would ever have that kind of impact, but they did. And when we read Hebrews chapter 11, we read about all these people who made these tremendous impacts because of their faithfulness to God. And what the writer of Hebrews is telling us when he, when he starts out writing chapter 12, verse 1, when he says, therefore, he's saying, listen, you just got to do basically what these people did. You just got to be faithful to God. You just got to follow what God's saying to you. The the writer is telling us that we've got some people who ran this race before us, who left a great legacy for us to learn from, to be able to help us run this race. You know, it's going to be difficult for you to be a Christian if you don't read the Word of God. It's going to be difficult for you to be a Christian if you don't have an understanding of who God is. It's going to be difficult for you to be a Christian if you don't know what, 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 what it's all about. And when we read the Bible, the Bible tells us, hey, this is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. This is what Jesus did for you on the cross. And without the understanding of those things, how can we run the race? You know, can you imagine, you know, kids... Uh, it's, it's all, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll share this example. Kids are absolutely amazing because, you know, I, I love going to my nephew's sports days because it's the one time that you can watch them run and you don't have to yell at them to tell them to stop. You, run at, you yell at them to tell them to keep going, right? So, you know, my nephews, they're, they're always running up and down. They love to run. I, I think that they need to go into track and field because they just absolutely love running. And, you know, when they, whenever they have these races at their sports day, They always come to this like obstacle course race. And the parents are, it's always funny because you can hear the parents, they're standing up on the the sidelines and we're there. You know, we're looking at this obstacle course race that they have to run. And you can almost hear all the parents simultaneously go, I wonder if they know how to run this race. Because you're looking at it and you're completely confused as to what they need to be doing. 
You're looking at the race and you're going, I, I, so you know, you can always look at the parents and see I'm bending. Now, you know how to run this race? You know what you're supposed to do? And the kids are always like, yeah, yeah. And they, you know, they're ready, they're excited, they're ready to go. But the parents are all looking there a little bit confused because they're not really sure exactly what this race entails. You see, and that's kind of what it's like being a Christian and not knowing what the Word of God says. You're standing on the sidelines and you're looking at the race and you're going, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing. But when we look at the Word of God, when we examine the Word of God, what it allows us to do is it helps us to learn what that race entails. So when somebody looks at you and they say, what does that race entail? When you're looking at them and they're, they're a bit confused and they go, you know, I'm not really so sure what I'm supposed to be doing. You can say, hey, let me, let me show you. Let me show you the instruction manual. If you just read this, it, it gives you the instruction. It, it shows you, it teaches you exactly what you need to be doing, how you need to be living this life, how you need to be following in the footsteps of what God has said to you and left for you. You see, the Bible is filled with story after story after story of people who persevered and pushed forward in their faith. That cloud of witnesses, that's who they are. That's what that therefore means. It means, therefore, since we've got all these amazing people who've come before us, guess what? We've got a lot that we can learn from them. You know, I heard somebody say this a few years ago. They were talking about, uh, I don't remember who, the, who, who they were speaking about, but they were speaking about one of the Olympic gold medalists. And they were asking one of the amateurs if they could ever ask this person a question, what they would ask. And, and they, they said, I would just ask him for some advice. To just give me a little bit of, a little bit of details, to just, just share a little bit of insight to me, to give me some tips as to how I can improve my running. And we already have that in the word of God. The Bible is that for us as Christians. It's, it's that thing that we can turn to, that we can look to, that's going to help us in the process of living out our faith and running this race that God's called us to run. We already, this book is full of the cloud of witnesses. We just got to read it. But you see, the cloud of witnesses, imagine this for me for a minute. Because I, I want to take it sort of beyond just the meaning of what the scripture, what the scripture is saying. Because I believe that there's another, uh, another thing that we can take away from this that's absolutely important as well. We've got the cloud of witnesses. Uh, uh, imagine with me, the cloud of witnesses is just a stadium full of people. And they're there to watch you run. They're there to, to see the race. There are people who are watching your life. And so we've got this stadium full of people. And just like how we read the Bible and we read about all the great things and, and even all the terrible things that people like Abraham and Noah and Moses, don't, don't walk away thinking that they were, they were all completely just wonderful people and didn't have any faults. No, they, they had some issues. They had some problems. If you read the Bible, the Bible doesn't try to hide any of those things. They all had their faults. They all had their problems. As a matter of fact, Many of us, when we read the Bible, we look at it and we kind of shake our head and we go, you know, David, the man after God's own heart, stealing another man's wife, then having him killed because he knocked her up. What's this? We read it and we go, you know, <laughs> these are the people that God used? Now that means that there's hope for us. <laughs> Thank God. See, we read about all the great things that we've done, but, but the Bible doesn't hide the terrible things that they did either. You know, as my parents used to tell me, they said, we made mistakes and we tell you about them so you don't have to make them too. And this is sort of what the word of God does for us. Is that it opens our eyes to be able to see the mistakes that other people made so that we don't have to make those same mistakes. You know, someone had to touch fire the first time to find out that it was hot. But I tell you what, nobody else had to touch fire afterwards to find out that it was hard if they would just listen to wisdom, right? And it's the same thing. But here's the thing, is that there are people, there's a cloud of witnesses, there are people that are looking at the way that you're living your life. There are people that are, are watching you every day as you run this Christian race, as you say, uh, the minute you say you're a Christian, guess what? Be ready for people to be watching you. It's like standing up and saying, I'm the fastest man or the fastest woman in the world. 
Because from that moment on, what's going to happen? People are going to start watching to see if it's true. And you see, though, the cloud of witnesses that the, the, the writer of Hebrews is talking about are those who have, have gone on before us. There's also a cloud of witnesses that are here with us today. Our family members, our friends, the, the people that we work with, the random people that we meet on the street. Those are the cloud of witnesses that, that are a part of our lives every day. And they're watching us run this race. Looking on, being a witness to the race that you're running right now. Here's the thing is that when you're a fan, when you're in the stadium, when you're up on the, in, in, the, in, in the bleachers, and you're looking down, guess what you're doing? You're looking at the race that's being run, the game that's being played in that moment. Even though it's great to be a part of the crowd, there's no reason being there if there's not something happening in front of you. If there's not a game to cheer on. But here's the thing is that when you're running the race, here's what most often happens. You don't pay attention to who's in the stadium. You don't know who's in the crowd. You look and you may see hundreds or thousands of people around you, but guess what? You've got a race to run. You've got some work to do. You've got something that's in front of you that you need to be doing. So guess what you can't be doing? It's paying attention to who's in the stands. Because you've got a job to do. You know, it's always interesting. Whenever you watch the Olympics, you know, they're getting ready to run the 100-meter dash, let's say, or the 200 meters. And they come out and, and all of a sudden, you know, they come out and, and they call the people's name and, you know, they say, Usain Bolt, and, you know, he does his little thing. Asafa Powell, he does his thing. Justin Gatlin or whoever it is that's running, you know, he'll wave to the crowd. But after that, guess what? They don't care that you're there. They're ignoring you from this point on because guess what? They realize that it's time to get down to business. And so when they're preparing and they're getting in the blocks and they're getting ready to run their race, guess what they're not doing? They're not paying attention to the cloud of witnesses. But guess what? The cloud of witnesses is paying attention to them. You see, they know that they've got a race to run, but they have to be focused on their race. And I'm not telling you to ignore people in your life. That's not what I'm saying. So don't walk away taking that, part, that point because that's not the point. The point that I'm trying to make is that you've got a race to run. You've got some things that God's calling you to do. You've got a purpose from God, a plan from God for your life. And the thing that you can't be doing is being so busy waving to the crowd that you're not taking the time to focus in on what God's calling you to. You know, listen, popularity is one of the things that will kill absolutely kill your, your, what, what God's calling you to do if you're not careful. Because it's so easy to get caught up in, in, in the fame and the fortune of people knowing you and, and people seeing you and people being there for you. It's easy for, 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 for you to get distracted with, with, with your talent and your gift and the thing that God has given you and put into your life. It's easy to do that. It's, it, how many people have we seen that God's gifted and talented, you know, that he's given them a, a, a voice to sing? And, you know, they start out in the church. And, you know, they're praising the Lord. And then, you know, all of a sudden somebody comes along and they hear them sing and they go, man, you got such a beautiful voice. Why you don't come and sing for me? We can make some money. And then they go and they start singing. And I'm not against people singing. But all of a sudden, they end up down a path where they've completely forgotten all about God, the thing that God called them to do, the purpose that God had for them. And all of a sudden, they're rich, they're famous, but they're no longer living for God. I'm not saying you can't be popular and don't serve the Lord. What I'm saying is, is if you don't have your priorities right on the race that you're running, you're going to get tripped up. And it's easy for that to happen sometimes. You see, the witnesses are, are looking very intently at you. They're watching you run the race. They're watching what you're doing. They're watching every stride. They're watching every movement. They're watching every hurdle that you jump over. 
They're watching every single thing that you do. And here's the thing is that you need to be asking yourself one question. What do they see? What do they see when they watch you? Do they see somebody who's, who's running the race the way that God's called them to run? Do they see somebody who, who's living out the word of God? Somebody who's, who's, when they say that, hey, I'm a Christian, that they're actually trying to walk and live the Christian life. Is that what they see when they look at you? You know, it's always interesting. When you talk to people and, 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 and all of a sudden, you know, you start, maybe you're mentioning that the fact that somebody comes to your church. You know, oh yeah, you know. Tommy from down the road, yeah, man, he comes to my church now. He, he plays on a praise and worship team and he sings and all that. Him? I said, Tommy over down at my yard last night, drunk, passed out. We were playing dominoes and we had, we had to pick him up and carry him inside the house because he was so far gone. Now they look at that and they, they're a witness. But when they look and they, and they see the race that he's running, they don't see a good race being run. They don't see a good witness of his life. You see, we've got to, we, we've got to realize that even though we're not always aware that people are watching us, people are watching us. You know, whenever I talk to parents, I always tell parents, as I said, don't talk to your kids, show your kids. Uh, I shouldn't say don't talk to your kids, but my point is, is that your kids are looking more at what you're doing than what you're saying. So if you tell your kids don't touch the fire, but you touch the fire, guess what your kids are going to want to do? They're going to want to touch the fire. They're going to look at you and, and, and they're going to see what you're doing and they're going to want to follow what you're doing. And even though you may tell them something that's contrary, you know, you want to say, do as I say, not as I do, guess what most often happens? They do as you do, not as you say. And then we look at it and we go, how did, how did this happen? Where, where did it, how did we get here? You see, do, do people, when they look at your life, do those cloud of witnesses, when they look at your life, do they see you pushing forward, striving all for the sake of the gospel, or do they see something else happening in your life? Do they see you pushing forward for the sake of your witness and your testimony of Jesus Christ and who he is as the risen Lord and Savior, or are they looking at your life and they see something completely contrary to that? See, you can run for God or you can run for the devil. It's up to you. But the question is, what are people witnessing in your life when they look at you? And when the writer of Hebrews is, is talking to us here in chapter 12, he's saying, listen, you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and there are those who have gone before you who have run this race. You can look back at their life, but there are also people right now who are alive looking at your life and being witnesses to your life. And when they look at your life, what do they see? You know, we we're all going to slip and fall. There's not one of us that are immune to the fact of sin. We all have it. Jesus is the only perfect person. But what do we do in this situation? If they're looking at us, then where do we need to be looking? Where are you looking right now? Well, you know, verse 1 and verse 2 give us a pretty good answer to this question. Because in, 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 in parts of verse 1, it, it says, let us run. And then in verse 2, it tells us, do what? Looking on to Jesus. So the writer of Hebrews looks at us and he says, therefore, you've got this cloud of witnesses that have come before you. You've got a cloud of witnesses watching you right now. And you're supposed to be running this race, but what are you going to do in the midst of running this race? You've got to look to Jesus. You see, for the Christian, the thing that, that we need to keep our eyes on is the prize. And who is our prize? Jesus is our prize. He's our prize. There's a song that says, we are his portion and he is our prize. He loves us with his everlasting love. He loves us more than we could ever understand, more than we could ever comprehend, more than we could ever think. He died for us because he loved us. And yet, 
So often when we run this race, we don't keep our eyes focused on the prize. We focus on the problem. We focus on the crowd. We focus on, on all the noise that's happening around us instead of keeping our eyes peeled and focused on that finish line, on the end, on the prize that we're running for. You see, a runner always has the end in mind. They always have the end in mind. They always keep pushing forward. They're always, what we're talking about, running toward the goal. That's what they are focusing on. I've got a race to run a finish line I need to cross, and I want to finish this race the best I can. The best that I can. They've always got the end in mind. As a mid to long distance runner, I I became acutely aware of this as a teen, teenager. Because, you know, you would, you would, in the beginning of the race, at least this is what I used to do, I would, I would give it a good little go to try and get a, a good head start. And then I would ease back and pace myself. And so I would run for some time and, and, and just keep myself at a slower pace. But, but in the beginning of the race, I would take off with a decent amount of speed so I could try and get myself ahead of a few people. And then I would ease back and, and relax just a little bit and, and, and go to the cruising speed, basically. So I would run for a while at that speed. And, and if I need to pick up the pace a little bit, I'd, I'd pick it up a few. And if I needed to drop back a little bit, I would drop back a little bit. But, but I would try to pace myself throughout the race. But here's the thing is that particularly when you're running long distance races and the, and the Christian life is, is a long distance race, it's not a hundred meter dash. Here's the thing that, that would often happen is you would be aware of how close you were to the finish line. That was the goal. The goal was the prize. And so, you know, whenever we would run cross country in school or, or if I was running at the track or whatever it was we were doing, I would always have in mind the fact that, hey, I am, you know, in another few moments, I'm going to be coming up on, on close to the end of the race. And here's what would always happen, no matter how tired I was towards the end of the race. When I kept my eyes focused on the prize, on the finish line, you know what would always happen? I'd get my second win. Sometimes it'd be third and fourth win, but I would get second win. And so here's what that means, is that I'm running and all of a sudden, I'm tired. But I realized that I'm getting closer to the end, and so what would I do? I would push myself harder, and even though my legs feel numb and I, and I don't feel like I, I need to walk instead of run, I would continue to push myself, and I said, I'm going to keep going until I reach the end. I'm going to finish this race. I'm going to get the prize. And so I would push, and I would push, and I would push, and I would run, and I would run, and I would run. And even though I've been pacing myself all along, now I'm no longer pacing myself. Now I'm saying, I'm going to run as fast as I can, as hard as I can, until I reach the end. Listen. When we keep our eyes on the prize, there's going to be times where we're going to get tired. There's going to be times where we're going to be weary. There's going to be times where our feet are numb, where we're breathing hard, where we're sweating hard, where the sun is beating down on our head. But here is the thing, is that if we keep our eyes on the prize, we'll get that second win. And when we feel like giving up, we'll keep moving forward. You know, I love what Jesus tells Paul He says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. In those moments where we feel like giving up, if our eyes remain on Jesus, we can keep pushing into the things that God's calling us to. We can keep running this race and moving forward that even though sometimes we're going to stumble. And here's the thing is when you get to that point and your second wind kicks in, your legs are tired. And when you're running, you know, your form kind of gets a little messed up. And, and so you're running and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're kind of waddling along as you're running. But you're going to keep going. As a matter of fact, there's times where you trip. There's times where you stumble. As a matter of fact, I've seen people fall. But what do they do? They get up and they keep going. 
And there's going to be times in your Christian faith where you're going to have to do exactly that. Where you're going to knock, get knocked down, but you've just got to get back up and be determined that I'm going to follow Christ. I'm going to run for Christ. That he is my prize, and I'm going to win that prize. I'm going to go after that prize. I'm going to chase after that prize. But that's what happened to some of us. This is what's happened to some of us in our lives. Some of us, the reason why we are where we are right now is because we've taken our eyes off the prize. We've taken our eyes off the prize. We've taken our eyes off of Jesus and put our eyes on something else. Can you imagine you, Saint Bolt, running the 100 meters? And the whole time he's running, he's looking up like this, looking to see, you know, what's everybody in the crowd doing? Can you imagine that? It's inconceivable. When he goes to run that race, we expect him to keep his eyes on the prize. And it's the same thing with us, you see, because what happens is, is, is some of us have taken our eyes off of Jesus and we put our trust in our economic situation or we put our trust in a political person or we put our trust in some political system or social system and when it fails us, we feel like all life has ended. We put our trust in politicians and preachers and teachers and all these people. Hey, listen, if we don't keep our eyes on Jesus, we're going to be disappointed every time. It's what's going to happen to us. Because when we start running this race, guess what? If you keep your eyes on me, I'm going to be honest with you now. If you're going to keep your eyes on me, I'm going to fail you. I'm sorry, but I'm not the perfect person. I'm not the person you need to keep your eyes on. You can look at me for for some advice. You can come to me for, for some direction. But here's the thing is that the person that you need to be focused on most of the time, all the time, is Jesus, not me. It's not about me and it's not about you. If I keep my eyes on you, guess what? The, thing, the same thing's going to happen. You know, this is what's happening in our marriages, in our families, is that we're focusing so much on the person instead of focusing on Jesus. You see, the Bible tells us that he has to be in the midst of all of it. That he needs to be in the middle of our lives. And if he's not, then this is where things begin to fall apart. We get in a rut and we lose our peace, we lose our joy, and we wonder how... How could this have happened? Listen, if you look at the world today and your eyes are on the world today, guess what? Your heart should be troubled. Let's just be honest. Then we look at the condition of the world today. I don't care whether you're a Christian or not. If you look at the world today, the world is worse off today than it was yesterday. And if you look at the world, your heart will be troubled. You will not have very much peace. You will not have very much joy. And Jesus tells us this in John 16, 33. He says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Notice what he says. In me, say that with me, in me. He says, you may have peace. So without being in him, guess what? Where's the peace? It ain't there. He says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know, the reason why some of us are lacking that peace, that joy, that, that, that satisfaction of being a Christian is because we put our eyes on somebody who is not Jesus. We put our eyes on something that is not Jesus. And as long as our eyes remain in a place where Jesus is not, then guess what? We will not have peace. We will not have joy. We will not have satisfaction. Not in the completeness like God intended for us to have. Because it's only in him that we have that. We need to keep our eyes on him. You know, I remember uh, when we were having our, our Acts graduation, and, uh, and our guest speaker for the graduation was Pastor Randy from Cayman Islands Baptist. And I'll never forget that as he was preaching the message, he, he was talking about just, you know, the, the message that Jesus left behind for his disciples. And I remember him saying, he said, You know, it was interesting that when Jesus was ascending into heaven, that it was almost as if the the disciples had to look up to see Jesus, and it was almost as if Jesus was looking at the disciples and telling them, keep your chin up. Keep your chin up. You know, that, that, that just resonated so profoundly in my heart, because guess what, is that we've got to keep our chin up, but by keeping our chin up, guess what, we keep looking up to the Father. We keep looking up to God. We keep looking up to Him. And that's where our eyes need to be. You need to fix your eyes on Jesus. You know what? You know what fixing your eyes on Jesus is like? 
The other day, I broke a, uh, a little plastic thing. And I had to take some super glue to fix it. So I took and I put the super glue on it, and guess what I did? I stuck it there, and guess what? It's, it's, it's working now. It's fine. It's all good. It's back to normal, basically. Here's my point. Is that what we need to do is we need to super glue, glue our eyes to Jesus. Fix our eyes on him and just keep them there. And no matter what comes our way, no matter what we may face, no matter what we may go through, if our eyes are fixed on him, it'll make all the difference. Now, the author of Hebrews is, 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 is doing something really interesting here because he's writing, this is the purpose behind why he writes the book of Hebrews, is he's writing to a group of Jewish Christians. And what had happened was these Jewish Christians had begun to waver in their faith because they were expecting Jesus to come back. You know, they, they wouldn't have expected that by 2,000 years later that we were still waiting on the return of Jesus. They were being, so they were expecting Jesus to come back a lot sooner. They were being persecuted. They were facing difficulty and uncertainty. And the writer of Hebrews writes this letter to them. And doesn't that sound familiar like what some of us are facing here this morning? Uncertainty. Difficulty. Maybe persecution. Maybe, maybe some doubt, some fear. But here's the thing that the writer of Hebrews realizes, that he realized that in order for them to continue to push on in this race, in order for them to keep moving forward, they had to do something. They had to take their eyes off themselves. They had to take their eyes off their problems. And they had to fix their eyes on Jesus. And without doing that, it it, it just isn't going to work. And that's what we need to be doing. If you're a Christian here today, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. If you're not a Christian today, you need to fix your eyes on Jesus because he is the answer. You see, over and over again throughout the book of Hebrews, the author points us to the incomparable glory of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He shows them his supremacy. He shows them his lordship over all things. He says, you've got to keep your eyes focused on him because Jesus in all his majesty and all his splendor and all of his glory says is incomparable in all of his ways and he is lord over all. Fix your eyes on him. And if you're going to run this race, you need a revelation of who Jesus is. You need a revelation of the incomparable glory of Jesus Christ and his person and the work of, that he did on the cross. And without that, without that, you're going to struggle. It's still a struggle, let's be honest. It's hard sometimes to walk in faith. But look at Hebrews 12 too. Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, let's read that together on the country. One, two, three. Looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Listen, that's who we've got to know him as. If we don't know him as the author and the finisher, guess what? We're going we're gonna to have a hard time. Now, what does this mean, author? Well, the word author is simply translated as the word originator. You know, you don't have faith because you're such a faithful person. You have faith because Jesus Christ has given you a little bit of faith. And then he's the finisher. He's the perfecter of our faith. So Jesus gives us faith, and then what he does is he works in us. He works through our lives in order that the faith that he's given us may be perfected so that we can believe He perfects it into whatever it is we need. You see, the cloud of witnesses lives to testify to the reward of the life of faith. That's what Hebrews chapter 11 is about. Testifying to the reward of the life of faith. And it was Jesus who blazed the trail and gave us the ideal model for what faith really was. And that's why we need to fix our eyes on it. Because he has already perfected it. You see, the goal of of the journey, the fulfillment of their faith was to be found only in the person of Jesus Christ. That's it. You see, on the track, you have a beginning and you have an end, and Jesus is at both points. 
He's the author. He's the originator. He's at the starting line waiting giving you the faith to believe that you can move forward, that you can push on, that you can win this race. And he's at the end. He's waiting for you, calling you, saying, come on, son, come on, daughter. You can finish this race. And guess what? He's running with us as we run through this race, cheering us on, saying, hey, I'm here with you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Here's a little bit more grace that you need to keep you moving forward in this race. Can we trust in him? Can we believe in him? Can we believe that Jesus will do what he said he would do? He's at the beginning, at the end, and in the middle. He's not leaving us. He won't forsake us. But I want to end this morning with this scripture, Hebrews 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. You know, as Christians, we, we try so hard, so often to to move out of the things that we're struggling with. We try so often to to shake off the sin, to move past it. But here's the thing, is that if we don't focus on Jesus, we can't. We can't. If we're not looking to Jesus, we're looking in all the wrong places. We've got to look to him, the author and the finisher, the originator and the perfecter. That's what he does. You know, it's interesting because as a pastor, sometimes people come to me looking for forgiveness. You know, and, and even sometimes my, my own friends joke and, and they'll say, you know, please forgive me. Don't, don't, don't call down fire from heaven. And they're just joking with me, but, but you know, I, I, I oftentimes have to tell people, say, you know, you're looking for forgiveness, but it's not me that needs to forgive you. It's not my forgiveness that, that you seek. The only thing I can do is point you to the one who is able to wash and cleanse all sin, and that's Jesus Christ. I can't do it. It's not in my power. It's not in my ability to be able to do that. And it's not in yours either. Not for yourself and not for anyone else. Jesus is the only person that's able to do that. And if we're going to look to him, if we're going to keep our eyes on him, guess what? If you're struggling with sin today, the only way you're going to be able to overcome that sin is to keep your eyes on Jesus because he's standing there with his arms wide open say, come to me. Come to me, all of you who are burdened, who are heavy laden. You see, it's always been Jesus. It's always been him, and it will always be Jesus. He is the answer. And our greatest struggle in life is always going to be believing in Jesus. Because when we believe in him, when we put our faith in him, when we put our trust in him, if we believe what the word says, then we believe that all things are possible with him who believes. Him who believes what? Who believes in Jesus. And if we can't believe in him, that's going to be our greatest struggle. That's why God gave us faith that we could believe in Jesus. And that's why Jesus is perfecting it. So can you fix your eyes on Jesus today, no matter what you're facing, no matter what you're going through, no matter what what you're experiencing, what your mind may say, what your situations may say, can you trust in Jesus today? Because today is the day to run into his arms. Thank you for watching our television program, and we pray that you've been blessed by today's message. I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, and I'd like to take this opportunity to pray with you today and ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Because if you don't, I want you to pray with me this prayer and accept him into your heart today, and you too can be a child of God. Let's pray this prayer. God, I repent of my sin. I'm sorry for all the wrong that I've done. And I ask you to come into my life today. Cleanse me and make me whole. I'm sorry and I ask you to lead me down the path of righteousness for your name's sake. I want to be your child and I want to do your will. Have your way in me today, Lord. And I will forevermore live for you. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That's all you had to do, folks. It's as simple as that. And so if you pray that prayer today, you're a child of God. And so I want to get you plugged into a church. Get plugged into a body, a fellowship of Christ somewhere. And get deeper into your relationship with God. Because there's no greater relationship than a relationship with Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a wonderful day with Jesus.